Hi, welcome to uh, GC Casual Friday from In the House. I'm Chris Colvin. I'm the founder of In the House. I'm here with David Slater, who's the co-host of GC Casual Friday, and also Nita Sanger, who is the COO of In the House. So it's great to have Nita. She joined us recently to be part of the executive team. Um, and I'm delighted today to have as a guest, Denise Heyman Loa. Um, we are actually working with Denise to upgrade the online uh, platform for In the House. And she has a lot of great ideas about how um, legal departments can use tools to better connect with their employees, with their internal stakeholders, such as uh, the business units and the C-suite, and also with external stakeholders, such as law firms and legal technology vendors and other suppliers and supporters of the legal department. So in talking with Denise, uh, Nita and I just thought she'd be a great guest to sort of have some creative ideas for you guys, especially right now. We need lots of new thinking about how to connect with all of the people you know, we serve and all the people we interact with in our in-house practice. So Denise, if you don't mind, just introduce yourself a little bit and talk about some of the work you do, and then we can proceed to um, your presentation. Okay, yeah, thank you, Chris. I'm very happy to be here. It looks like a, a fun group, and it's a good way to spend a Friday afternoon, although I am jealous of Richard's beer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I have actually many years of experience on Wall Street and financial services. I worked at firms like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, and then I was also a management consulting partner at Ernst & Young. And in that role at Ernst & Young, I, I, Anita understands this because she has a similar background. I did a lot of process consulting for all different departments of enterprise size organizations. And so I can apply some of that learning to the discussion today, but then also since uh, 2014, I've been the CEO and co-founder of a company that has developed, that we'll talk about briefly in our conversation today, where we've developed a social and collaboration platform that is very secure and very efficient for cross-team interaction. So we'll talk about that as well. Fantastic. So if you're ready, um, then Denise, I'll go ahead and share my screen and we can get started with the presentation. Sure. And again, we welcome any questions. We prefer an interactive session. Absolutely. So join in at any time. And Denise, just tell me when you'd like me to advance the slides. Okay. Yeah, so the discussion today is really focused on corporate legal departments and how to improve collaboration with internal and external stakeholders. As Chris mentioned, the, it can get quite complicated to bring all those different parties together, but to give them each a secure and efficient experience and to manage who sees what when. You can go to the next page. That's just a little bit more about me. I already sort of described my background, but just to reinforce a few points, I've, I've been in the industry for 34 years. I've been the CEO of our company for six, and we started as a small beta platform, and now we're a fully developed platform that has garnered multiple awards. We have a number of clients and a number of prospects in, in prominent areas. Whoops. I'm going backwards somehow. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There we go. So when we think about the corporate legal department, there are, as Chris mentioned, internal and external stakeholders. So there are internal clients, the different business units, the, the C-suite, any different operational areas that the department needs to interact with. And then on the right-hand side, we have all the different outside providers. They could be other fir law firms that provide services on different, different particular initiatives. Or it could be, as, as Chris mentioned, it could be technology firms or um, different vendors of, of, or partners of any, any type. And currently, those conversations are happening in multiple ways. And they're not only are they inefficient, but they're not secure. So if you think about email, email is a predominant tool that we all use and we all love. But how many times have you seen an email forwarded to the wrong person? or an email that has been forwarded to a group and someone has missed? Or have you ever been on an email chain, you're suddenly invited later, and you, you can't follow all the gobbledygook that's gone before because there's not a proper history? And then phone calls are great, and we probably don't do enough of those, but they're, 
there's also the follow-up and how do you make sure that the notes are properly taken and that there's true uh, agreement in terms of what's been said. And then people use Google Docs for document sharing and they use spreadsheets and all different tools that are kind of cobbled together. And some organizations are using uh, different messaging platforms like Slack or they have uh, sort of Microsoft Teams or things like that. But again, it's disjointed and there's not a comprehensive solution that's secure. So you're gonna hear me talk about the word secure and efficient quite often in this conversation today. So you can go ahead and forward that, Chris, unless you wanted to add anything. No, no, I, I, but I agree on that perspective. I've seen, you know, I've had a 25 year legal career so far and uh, it's definitely been a hodgepodge in my experience. Um, and the legal department, it seems, typically either relies on sort of those generally available tools or whatever the IT department happens to provide for employees in general. And I always think that the legal department, maybe I'm biased being a lawyer, but I tend to think legal departments have special needs, special confidentiality needs, other types of, um, as a internal service provider, I think there's unique needs of the legal department that aren't always addressed by the sort of one size fits all platforms that either come from IT or come from you know, traditional outside providers. So that's the only thing I would add, just my years of experience. With no, that's absolutely right, absolutely right. So just to reinforce some of the points um, that we've both been making, the often internal and external digital communications are siloed across multiple tools, which impacts security and efficiency. So I promised I would use those words a lot. It's a, it's a real, that's a very big focus for me and it's also a big focus for our platform. And, and a really, it's clear, I think that today's world with the COVID situation and the remote working from home situation has just emphasized the importance of those two words in, in processes. And so people are using email, they're using WebEx or Zoom, and there, there are also security issues, as we know, with Zoom, even though we're on Zoom right now, and we all love Zoom, but there have been a lot of security issues related to it. Uh, people are using Slack, which doesn't have the security issues per se, but is not necessarily the most user-friendly environment. It's kind of tech-oriented. Or Yammer, which is another tool that people use that's a kind of um, a little older style and not as integrated. Uh, lots of places have SharePoint, which has tons of functionality. My, what I hear, though, is that it, it can be confusing um, to use. And then there are, as Chris mentioned, also other internal tools that people use or have developed um, over the course of time. But how do you really think about improving those interactions and collaborations in, with internal and external stakeholders in a secure, efficient way? So it's one thing to, uh, to interact internally, but when you start to think about that three-way conversation between an internal department, an external law firm, and the corporate legal department, you, you start to realize that there are some, some, some disjointed natures in terms of how that communication is happening today. And there's definitely efficiencies that can be incorporated in that communication. You can switch to the next page. So what we're, our, our perspective, and I think that Chris and Nita share this perspective, uh, we've had a number of conversations about this, is that CLDs need to be able to connect and communicate in a secure yet flexible environment. So if you go around the circle here from the left, starting over on the left, team, practice area, or office-based groups and connections, so it needs to be a flexible structure that allows for those kinds of dynamic teams to be set up. And a, a team might be a, a, a particular group in a particular region, or maybe it's um, the group that focuses on a certain type of law, maybe it's the IP attorneys within the organization, or um, you got tricky <laughs> fingers there. <laughs> yeah, I think when uh, it's very sensitive, so when I touch my mouse accidentally, it sort of advances PowerPoint. Oh, yeah. So You're just trying to confuse me. Uh, see if I can stay on keeping my you on, on your my toes. Flow. Keeping me on my toes, seeing, seeing if I can stay on flow and on point. <laughs> yeah, but any uh, different examples of you know office-based groups? I mean, maybe there are different uh, divisions in different parts of a global organization, and they need their own environment. They need their own local conversation uh, points, but they also need to connect more broadly across the organization. Then, if we go down lower, the next 
lower right, I mean, lower left policies, thought leadership and information requests, I and mean, how are these stored? How are they accessed? We have one of our clients is a private equity fund, and they're using our technology, for example, to do all the legal, HR, IT, and operational communications across their 15 portfolio companies. So they're using it in, at this point purely internally, um, but it's external as well because it's all their, you know, these 15 companies. And the legal department has a, a group that crosses all companies, but then there's also subgroups between legal and some of the companies, depending on the issues, like some of their companies are healthcare companies, so they have different issues. And they're, they're really have finding it very advantageous, especially during COVID, because there's a lot of compliance policies and, and different procedures and, and um, rules and, and things that they need to comply with and that they need to follow up on. And they were doing those conversations with tons of phone calls and emails and and Google Docs and everything was very cumbersome, especially for the person that was managing the whole the whole uh, environment within the, the fund company. So it's a the idea is to have a place where where all the content can be stored. Anything that is evergreen that people need to be able to respond to and come back to can be stored in a common environment. Then uh, upper right hand corner, video conferencing is also key, as we discussed with. Zoom that I mentioned earlier, um, but that video conferencing needs to be secure. Zoom is great, like I said, but it's not highly secure. And in fact, we just heard about somebody suing Zoom for lack of security. So it's a real issue. Uh, we have actually integrated two different video conferencing tools into our platform, and you have to be a member of the platform and you get a secure password every single time there's a meeting set up. So it adds a, multiple layers of security. Then there's also the need for private group chats. So there are many times when you want to have a quick and efficient conversation, but it needs to be private, completely private and secure. And, and that's what our technology does, for example, where you, have, you can have one-on-one -on -one conversations, you can have private group conversations, or you can have team conversations. And they're in each secure channel and there's documents that are associated with them that are also secure. And then meeting scheduling is very helpful. A lot of organizations have meeting schedulers internally, but when you're, when you're scheduling something across, again, internal plus external, it can be helpful to have something that everyone can access. Then uh, lower right-hand corner, rich profiles for team members is helpful because then you really know who everybody is. It's not absolutely essential, but it's nice to have. Um, backgrounds on people, expertise areas especially is important. So which attorneys have which, which sets of expertise. If you're looking for a particular piece of knowledge or a particular capability, it's nice to have that be efficient instead of the, the usual world right now is where you're calling around or you're trying to remember or you're asking a buddy and you know who do you know that knows this? And to have that all documented and, and easily accessible is very helpful. And then project management, it's, it's helpful to have project management integrated as you're working on something together as a team to know who's responsible, what the deadlines are, what the documents that are associated with that project are, all in an integrated environment. And it needs to be completely secure with multiple levels of privacy. I mean, I, again, I, I'm harping on this because to me, this is probably the most important thing is the lack of security when you have siloed tools. So having an integrated tool and having it be secure from end to end where there's, where there's um, affirmation that everybody who joins is a real person and they've, had, they've been validated and there are multiple levels of security at the team level, at the content level, and at the interaction level. And then to build those relationships and trust through linked interest groups. So there may be additional layers of communication that are helpful to really you know, have people bond. I mean, in today's world with people working remotely, that trust layer is, can be a little tougher because you can't look eyeball to eyeball to somebody quite so easily. So it's very important to have that relationship and established and have the trust. I mean, I, I, um, I worked on Wall Street for many years and I used to actually have clients that I never had met in person. I mean, I was, you know, this was back before Zoom. And I'd, we'd have these great relationships and it would all be on a phone and then you'd finally get to meet them in person. And it just has that big impact of making that connection deeper. And that's how trust is built.
And one thing I wanted to add just on this slide in particular is that, you know, those of you who know me, uh, have known me for a while, you know, I've been talking for years with GCs on sort of operational uh, issues. And one thing that I've sort of, I guess I've been beating the drum for a while to encourage general counsel to think of themselves as sort of being at the center of the legal ecosystem. And I think for many years, law firms dominated, especially larger law firms dominated bar associations and kind of almost put themselves in the middle, right? Sort of, we almost, it's like that old poster of New York, you know, where New York's at the center of the universe and everything else is extending out from New York. I almost felt like that was the perspective that law firms had. And I get it, you know, that's where most of us started. A lot of us went through the big law firm experience. So we tend to start out that way. But I think it's really important, uh, even before the current circumstances, that the legal department start to think of itself as really being that center of the legal ecosystem and they're the closest to the client. And the other players in the ecosystem are really there to serve the corporate legal department. Um, so, um, so what I love about the emerging technologies like the one Denise, uh, com Denise's company works on, these are physical manifestations that help you create a hub that other people can plug into. So you serve internal clients in different business units, they can plug into your platform, you can have a secure environment where you relate to each of those business units, you can have another secure connection to the people in the C-suite that need to connect with you for making strategic decisions. You can have another secure environment for your vendors that can plug in as needed and you can require them to register on your platform so that they can interact productively with you. So I love the fact that this is almost a physical manifestation of this need to put the corporate legal department sort of at the center of this ecosystem. And, and so I encourage folks to think about these types of environments um, because, you know, one thing that we've heard from several GCs that I really applaud is that as horrible as the current work from home environment is, and the, the reasons for it are, are obviously very sad and tragic, um, there is leverage here. There, In-house counsel have new leverage over the various providers, including the law firms. And, um, you know, frankly, that leverage needs to be flexed a bit, and the law firms need to toe the line, and this is a good time to require that they step in line and provide services in a more client-driven way and in a more efficient way. I think taking this kind of step to plug them into a platform that you define and that you determine the structure of it can be a really, it's a really interesting thing to think about. And it's a way to more rapidly bring innovation to the way you run your operations internally. Um, so I don't know if David or Nita, you have any thoughts on sort of that environment and, and how these types of tools can play a role, but I'd love to hear from you guys as well as any questions anybody has. Uh, one issue I see in terms of adopting these uh, technologies uh, is the, to, to what extent there's, there's new learning curves with each uh, each application, each software uh, that, that has to be learned. Uh, and, uh, you know, versus going with the more off the shelf uh, common solutions. And I'm wondering, you know, if you had any thoughts about that, uh, you know, that tension. Yeah. When you say yeah. off the shelf, just to clarify your question, David. I mean, like, mean like, micro, like, like Microsoft, like my, you know, using Microsoft apps for everything as, as right. a, you know, uh, something like that. Okay. Yeah. No, that's a very good point, David. And actually something we have focused on from the very beginning with our platform. I mean, I don't know if other providers are doing it the same way, but we've actually used a lot of um, commonly understood visualizations. So the user experience for our posting technology looks a lot like a LinkedIn post. The, the user experience for our chat technology looks a lot like WhatsApp or texting on your phone instead of Slack, which is quite hard to fathom. Um, the user experience for our knowledge base is very similar to how you would access a, a, an article on a website. So we've and, and the same thing with the calendaring. It's very intuitive. It really steps you through. So we've worked really hard to make it intuitive for the end users for that exact reason that you, that you raised. 
ways. It should be easy to adopt and easy to understand and navigate. And a so, related question that I had, Denise, it's very similar to David, but a slightly different take. What would you say that, like somebody that, basically legal departments are not often in a position of, of having customized tools and instead they typically, I mean, some legal departments do, but I think it's more common to rely on what IT is already making available. So um, the tools set that already exists. So what are the sort of pros and cons of sort of using what's already out there as imperfect as it might be, as opposed to sort of creating a custom solution that might require maintenance and might require training and all the other things. So sort of what David had, had referred to, but sort of that larger issue of why do we, why can't we just use what's already available? Well, I think it depends on what is available. I mean, different firms are using different technologies. The often the technology is is brought in for other departments, not for the corporate legal department. So it really isn't necessarily geared towards a legal process or a legal conversation. And um, it might be, you know, depending on the company. I mean, it could be geared towards manufacturing, it could be geared towards services, it could be geared towards, you know, who knows, any kind of any kind of configuration. Um, so that's one aspect. And then the other aspect is that often the these enterprise tools are are still disjointed. I mean, it's still multiple tools, you still don't know where to find things. I even have a, I have a slide that I, I need to re, uh, replicate my own version of that shows how SharePoint for Microsoft Microsoft platform and Microsoft Teams are not really integrated and that you have to use them and define how you're using them for different things. So I think it's a combination. I think that, um, you know, there's, there's no perfect technology I and mean, there are always going to be things that people want differently or you have to adapt to. But the key is to have something that is suitable for the corporate legal department versus cobbled together from what's used for other departments for other purposes. And then to that, could I just add, Denise, would I, so I absolutely yeah. agree with you. I think what's really valuable is something that is bringing all of this together, which is why you know it's, it's very critical because the tools are just the means to the end, but something that can actually integrate and help in, integrate the various solutions so that the, you know anybody in the corporate legal department has one place to go to so that they can communicate with all the all their stakeholders, whoever that they're working with, that becomes really valuable. And on this, I think it's more of, it's less about the technology, it's more about the mindset. It's like the whole, how do you, like, so the change management aspect. And it would be great to get Charlie's thoughts on that because I think it's a very much of a people issue because people get so caught up in the technology, but it's not the technology. It's the, it's like, how do people deal with change and how do you sort of use it in a different way? So Charlie, we'd love to hear any thoughts that you have. Well, thank you, Nita. I, I, I'm flattered, but I don't know if I'm really in, in the right position to, to uh, speak to that. But, um, I, one of the things that does come to mind that may be related to that, however, <clears throat> is um, understanding the needs of um, your external stakeholders. And at any point in time, I'm just imagining using this as, let's say, I were the head of, uh, you know, or, or part of a, a corporate legal department, or anyone else who wanted to connect with, with external stakeholders. And immediately, one of the things that is potentially going to be foremost on their mind is security. And I, I know that that's not the be all and end all, but at some times and for some people, it is the number one thing and potentially a deal killer in terms of the use of a certain platform. And I'm just curious as to whether or not you are either, either you do with your platform or you know of ways that there may be some kind of a, almost like a, a third party validation, audit, confirmation, um, evaluation, uh, and certification body, like an ISO type thing, or a, I don't know, some sort of government agency that would say, this passes minimum standards for ISO, blah, 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 you know, what other n number that you might pick uh, there, or certain codes of standards. Is, is that something that's done? And because that it's not just do you pass those standards, but can you immediately 
make someone feel comfortable and willing to participate in a <clears throat> in using this by by having them know and be able to prove yes we have a certain level of security that's independently verified by somebody else yeah and charlie that's a great point and <clears throat> i'm <clears throat> excuse me i'm just as obsessed with security but you've heard me use the word about 50 times already today and uh, because I have a Wall Street background and my first job on Wall Street in 1980 was that I ran the security for Solomon Brothers for technology. And back then it was very prehistoric, but it was, it was still a, an important focus. So for me, security has been a, a key element all the way through. And I've actually written an article about, about thinking about remote work and security. I wrote a blog about that recently. Um, in terms of uh, about verifications, it looks like Richard has identified something that, that is a, an industry standard that certainly could be applied. What we've done on our side is that we have a guy um, who's on our team, who's been on our team, my husband's team actually, for over 20 years. And he started his career on the New York Stock Exchange, so he has a very high standard of care. And so everything that's, that has been set up is established through him in terms of being the highest standard of, of security. And then also within the platform, we have multiple layers of security. So there's security at the team or community level, there's security at the post level, at the chat level. There's security on the way in with a six digit code, a random six digit code to verify the person is who they say they are. We even have biometric security for people who really want that. We also were, one of our partners on a prior project was Unisys. And I don't know if anybody here knows who Unisys is, but they are a, a technology company that's highly focused on security, and they're actually the technology provider for the Department of Defense and NSA. And they vetted our technology and said that we were more secure than most banks they knew. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I feel pretty confident of our security. I mean, there's, look, there, I would be misrepresenting if I said that any, any security was 100, 100%, because it's not actually possible. But we, are, we maintain an incredibly high standard of security and we are the only firm that I know of in terms of this collaboration tool that allows you to maintain that level of security at so many levels and with external as well as internal organizations. Yeah, I know from just my general knowledge of cybersecurity, it's, as many of you know, it's an emerging uh, environment, right? So you have Europe with GDPR, you have uh, some California regulations, Colorado has some regulations. So that's that's a cybersecurity and privacy is kind of a fast changing field. So I think we're kind of watching that space because in a platform like this, you may have uh, internal client data that you may have ultimate client data where you you know that whatever constituency your company serves, they may be holding data that others have privacy interests in. So there's a lot of different overlapping issues that and it's a very com complex issue. But, um, you know, the, the one thing I think that is, is definitely a bit of an issue is everyone using sort of these third party tools like Zoom. I think it's a great tool for a more public discussion like this one, but, you know, it needs to be used carefully within the corporate environment. And the same would go for, you know, the other various, you know, sort of single use off the shelf sort of tools that, that are out there. One other area that really interests me. Yeah, go ahead. Nita. I think it's actually really valuable what Charlie just said that they almost need to because there's so many tools out there. It would really help if there was a body that could actually sort of say, yep, these meet certain standards and, and I don't know who that would be because if somebody could actually do that, that becomes so valuable for every general counsel because there's no way of knowing what the securities are because, and it's very hard to know all of these things. If somebody can actually get that stamp of approval, that would actually be very valuable. Yeah. yeah, I think that would be, I'm, I'm sure there is something. Now, the only thing I would, the only, again, uh, some, you probably think I'm a lawyer and I'm not because of the caveats I put on things. <laughs> but the only caveat I would say is technology is a constantly evolving you know, platform or tool. And what's secure one day may not be secure in the next. So it's, it, it shouldn't be, it's more about, it's as much a mindset as anything else. Like getting a nice stamp of approval is great, but what happens a month later? 
So you don't want to be overconfident because you've gotten a, a certification and then have that certification elap you know, lapse because the technology has changed. And then yeah. the other aspect of security is the, is the people side. There needs to be clear training of how to maintain security because a lot of people are very casual about it. So I think that's what Nita might have been alluding to when she called on you, Charlie. <laughs> yeah, yeah and I, also don't think, I also don't think you need to, you know, there's many cases, many companies have internal resources within IT to talk to, sort of help vet the security of various solutions. So it may not be that you need to have that all within the legal department. There are probably resources within your company to help you with those issues as well, at least yeah, if you're in a side legal point. company. Another area that I find really interesting that I wanted to just raise as a topic are the, the concept of the legal department as an internal service provider. Um, and you know, you wanna you wanna deliver high quality service to your internal clients, but there's also almost like a PR element, you know. So if you're perceived as an innovator and if you're bringing in a solution that will improve the quality of service you provide both to the executives to the company and, and the business units that you serve, I think that could be a really smart move in the current environment because a lot of us in the in-house community want to figure out a way, how do we really demonstrate our ROI to the company? You know, how are we making sure that we're perceived as not, you know, to use the old expression, we're not like the the uh, the house of no or the department of no, we're the we're really looking to help contribute to the success of the company and here's how we provide value. So I think having a tool like this or some you know, set of tools that provide a communications platform could be a really smart move for a legal department in a fast changing environment so that people know you have value. And when it comes to you know, the time of year to discuss budgets, you know, people recognize that, you know, that this type of tool can actually improve that bottom line that you're bringing. So I think I encourage people to think about that side of, of these types of uh, tools as well, because uh, it's important to have a good relationship with the others within the company. I think that's an important point. Really important, the whole idea of being innovative and forward thinking. Good, and I don't, did you have additional slides that you want yeah, to Yeah, there was another slide oh, that okay. just shows uh, an example, I think, of one of our, oh no, there's a summary slide, <laughs> okay. which I think we've talked about a lot of this already, but it's the whole, you know, reinforcing the concept that linking the internal corporate legal department with company clients and with external firms creates efficiencies. So in addition to the security, we didn't really talk that much yet about the efficiency element. But certainly there's, when you don't have to duplicate and you don't play telephone tag and you don't have emails flying all over the place, um, but everything is organized, that, that adds enormous amount of efficiency to the process. And it makes the, the department look good too, because you know, the, the different business units want efficient responses and they, they don't want to have things get complicated. They want them to be straightforward. And so that efficiency element is really important to, to focus on. So that key to success being a highly secure, as we talked about, one-stop solution with all the digital tools needed for working together in a controlled environment. So you have to be able to control the content as well as the environment and also have it be efficient in terms of it being a one-stop integrated solution. And then there was another page. So this is just an example of one of our clients is just to have so people can see it's real. <laughs> There's, it's just a visual of an, of an implementation. At, uh, this is a client of ours that is focused on the sustainable commercial real estate industry. But it, a lot of the templates can be used for other clients. And the, the platform provides this kind of rich functionality for reaching colleagues, client departments, external firms, offices, support functions. And as we've talked about already, increasing the effectiveness of collaboration in a seamless, secure, branded version that's accessible on any device. So that's another important point, is that being able to access what you need where you are and not have to always have, have it on a desktop is also a big efficiency focus. And also, if it can be in a secure environment on all devices and you know that it's secure across them, then that's also a big, a big, a big uh, requirement. 
So, Denise, can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. All right. So, I mean, it, it sounds like you've you built quite a comprehensive, you know, uh, combination of all the, all the different tools, you know, that, that are out there. And so how does this work with existing tools in terms of either as an overlay or a replacement? And what I mean by that is that in your early slide, you had sort of the, the CLD ecosystem. And I assume that the idea is that all the communication within that ecosystem takes place on this platform. But for the people who are on the outside of the ecosystem, you know, the edges of the ecosystem, right? Sorry about that. Um, then do they do they collaborate with the with the legal department through this? But if they're talking to people outside the ecosystem, they're using the the original tools, email, Slack, um, Zoom, and things like that. Yeah, unless they're a client of ours. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, they would. They, it would be a requirement that they would need to use this platform to communicate with the client, essentially. Um, so it would all be that. That would maintain the security and the efficiency and the sharing of information. Have it be organized, and it can be set up so that there are very, very private groups. And the private group, if there's a specific case that's being worked on or a specific project that only certain people are invited, and only certain if they if it's ultra private, nobody even sees that it exists. So that's the kind of level of privacy that can be implemented in the platform. I don't know if I answered your full question, Victor. Yeah, okay. Chris, I didn't know if you had yeah. any additional points you wanted to add. I think we no, covered- No, I mean, the one there. thing that occurs to me with these types of platforms that I think can benefit sort of the, uh, you know, to use an overused term, sort of the millennial types of people, especially that are used to, their digital natives, they're used to social media tools. And I think when, you're trying to attract those and retain those types of, uh, you know, the people that are digital natives, they respond well to these types of tools because um, one thing that, you know, to, to relate it to, you know, I'm part of a different generation, but it's funny, I used to work for IBM as an engineer back in the day, but I had been raised on Macs. So I had a Mac at home and then I go into work and use what seemed to me these very primitive IBM computers and uh, it was sort of an earlier version of what some millennials are experiencing now, where they use these very easy to use tools in their personal life, but then they feel like they go to work at the legal department and they feel like they're, you know, this dinosaur <laughs> style equipment that they're using. Um, because they really, a lot of millennials think, don't like email, they really don't like voicemail, and these things feel very primitive to them. So. I think, you know, as you think about the younger talent, the up and comers, this kind of thing could be a way to get more engagement from those folks. And, and that's actually a really important point. So that yeah. multi-generational workplace. And then of course, there are those that, you know, those of us who aren't millennials, but still feel like we love technology and like the benefits of it. And so it, it's not necessarily an age thing, it's more of an attitude thing. But, and I think that's a really important point and, and something that we see all the time with our clients that reinforcing we've, we've worked hard to make sure that the platform is is intuitive and that also it's suitable for all age groups. So multi generational is a good word. I'm going to use that. I'm going to borrow that from you. Yeah, <laughs> I won't claim a licensing fee. Okay. <laughs> so the, if and your then, clients, have any of your clients been able to monetize the, uh, the benefits? of bringing this platform in. I think from Victor's question, it's a replacement of existing technology. So I could see that as a savings, potentially. But what other ways do they um, monetize this? Well, that's a really good point, Preston. Um, I mean, for clients of ours, for example, this client, GSX, what, what they're doing is bringing together the architects, builders, and designers for sustainable commercial real estate. And so their, their whole business is, is going to be running on this platform. We're in the, in the development stage right now, rolling it out. And so they're going to be making money from membership dues, from advertisers, from product placements and the transactions, the sales that happen on products. So there's a number of different monetization strategies that our clients are using the platform for. Okay. Charging for events, 
Um, and, and actually the other interesting piece now that you bring that up is that we also have functionality for fundraising. So for nonprofits that the organization might be supporting, they can also do a fundraising um, campaign within the platform, which is kind of a nice, and that also appeals to the millennials in the, in the crowd but it's kind of a nice thing to be able to add in to, you know, this is our business tool, but by the way, we're raising money for kids education or, you know, poverty or whatever it is that the organization wants to, wants to support. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that one was a recommendation I would have um, in terms of using this in a corporate legal department environment. I think you can, it can be a nice tool to sort of, uh, in a way, uh, crowdsource information from the collection of law firms that you use. So for instance, you know, when you're looking for a referral for a very niche project that your existing law firms might not provide, a lot of us go and we email the lawyers we deal with. We might send 10 different emails. Hey, I'm looking, we're looking for this specialized expertise. Like I recently had someone that needed some extremely specialized expertise that related to, uh, dental importing dental tools to use in the, in the in the dentistry space and they needed someone with import export experience specifically with those <laughs> items and that's a very niche expertise that a, a law firm may or may not have relevant but that would be a good example of something where a platform like this you could sort of send out a blanket request to all the law firms you work with that are on the platform and they could provide secure uh, recommendations or referrals to you. And so it's a good way of almost training, you know, just like we now call people at outside firms for a little sort of free informal advice. This provides another tool to say, hey, I need a quick, I don't, you know, this isn't really billable, but I need some quick information. Does anyone have any information? And I would recommend using that as a way to extract more value out of your external providers. That's an interesting point, Chris. I mean, do you think there's the reverse is also true that the the law firms might have things they want to share that, I think it's that true. they want to be proactive about? I think so. And so I think one thing we've all seen is these sometimes annoying client alerts. I know that law firms are doing them and they want to provide value. But if I get another COVID-19 alert, I'm going to, you know, start really unsubscribing from all these law firms because it's annoying. I, I don't want to see the, the, the 50th COVID alert today, you know? And so I think a tool like this would be a much gentler way to sort of provide information. A law firm could start to, um, you know, post some information that it's a little less intrusive than sending a blast email to every in-house lawyer you've ever met, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. So I think those types of updates could be a useful tool. So I think so pulling people into your orbit as opposed to them viewing you as being in their orbit. It's a, it maybe sounds subtle, but I actually think it's an important psychological distinction. I get a quick question for Denise, if that's okay. Of course. Uh, Denise, I'm just curious um, if I have this clear, car carry, is that how it's pronounced? Is the name of your company right right carry is, is the product name well i'm sorry what is it Con connective is the product name okay right yeah yeah i just was confused because there's no i'm i'm because this is uh chris's uh webinar i'm 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 very sensitive to you know seeing a trademark or something like that but i feel <laughs> that's why i kind of um i assume that was the case is this something that also is used or could be used for internal, um, like a learning management system or training platform. And it, I ask because that really is something that I think would be very important with regards to the kind of a change management type of context here. Um, you can link to actual learning management systems, mm -hmm. um, which are, I mean, I think of a learning management system as a place that houses the courses and tracks whether people have taken those courses. Yeah. Um, there's other elements to learning, which is, you know, the cohort, like I, I, we've worked with some groups that are doing cohort training where there may be a class that people are taking, but then in between the class, there's homework that the whole cohort needs to do together. Right. And they use our collaborative tools for that. 
And also one of the um, video conferencing tools that we have embedded in the platform is called Big Blue Button. I know it's a silly name, but it's a great platform and it's, it was geared and designed for the education industry. And so it's like Zoom, but it has additional features, like uh, actually has whiteboarding built into it. Um, and they have connections to learning management systems directly as well. So there are a lot of ways to, to do that. Um, they, we can obviously put classes in the platform if they're encapsulated already. And the one thing we don't have is the ability to track who's taken the course. Hey, um, Denise, so I, 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 this is the least favorite part of the job here, but I, I'm the moderator, so I need to note that it's uh, 1250, so we're rapidly oh, running wow. out of time. Oh, wow. Oh, well, it's we better yeah, time tighten flies. up. So if you have any other yeah. slides you want to get to, let's no, do No, I that. think those are the important ones. I mean, this okay. last slide is just a, re a reinforcing of everything that we already talked about, you know, the idea of consolidating functionality in a single secure platform, the limiting access to only what each stakeholder needs to see. So we didn't really talk about that, but the noise reduction is also helpful. So people only access what they need instead of having to be exposed to you know, a long list of other people's comments. And then to have a really streamlined process that eliminates bottlenecks to, to eliminate double counting, double calling, double emails, and you know, bottlenecks in terms of the decision-making process. So again, I, I promise to support, to focus on these two words all the way throughout, and here I am wrapping up with those two words, but it's really that balance between security and efficiency. And it's tough to get that, but in a seamless, secure environment, you can. Well, that's great. I love these types of tools. And I think it's a really interesting sort of mind expanding process, especially for GCs and other in-house counsel to sort of open their mind to the non-traditional tools, because I think we do get stuck in this email and phone rut. And I sort of think of it as tools like this can almost free up phone and email for what they are originally intended to be, which is really important person-to-person -person communications, not collaborative project platforms. Because anyone who sat on endless uh, teleconferences where you're almost like, why am I here? Why am I part of this right now? Or this email chain that goes on forever. I think you know, those are sort of instruments that are better used for very close collaboration. And because there weren't, uh, traditionally there weren't other tools, they sort of, it was almost like a round uh, peg in a square hole. Email and phone sort of expanded beyond their original uses and they're not really customized for this type of work. Um, so anyway, I love that people like, people like you and others are developing these tools. So I, th I think that's a really interesting. We probably have time for just in a couple of minutes if anybody has one more question or, Nita or David, if you have any concluding comments. I just think this was great. Thank you so much, Denise. Oh, my pleasure. This was fun. It's really cool. It's, great it's cool audience. to have a technologist on, on, a, on these. We usually have lawyers, but it's nice to have a technologist. And you I don't think of myself as a pure technologist. I think of myself as a user experience strategist. And then, by the way, the technology supports it. So. Right. You know, the technology is just an enabler. It's all about the process and the way people interact with it. Absolutely. That's great. Well, that's a, that's a great way to end it. Um, thanks, Denise. Um, thank you, David and Nita as well. And uh, we're here every uh, Friday at noon Eastern time. So um, if uh, we're always looking for interesting guests. So if, if any of you on the call have any suggestions for folks you think bring value and interesting topics to the table, or if you want to volunteer to present on a topic of interest to the community, feel free to reach out to me. You can always find me at chris at inthehouse.org. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. So. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks.